The Classic Mac Pro. Much has been said about this computer and upgrading it over the past few years. Should anyone consider this Mac Pro in 2020? Could this Classic Mac Pro, after upgrades, challenge the new Mac Pro? We'll find out right after this. No. 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 This Classic Mac Pro cheese grater is not going to challenge the new 2019 Mac Pro. There are two key reasons you may want to consider this Classic Mac Pro in 2020. You need something that runs Mac OS, and you have a limited budget, at least in Apple dollars. In this video, we'll see just how easily upgradable it is and how really inexpensively you can put together a very capable system. And we'll benchmark three CPU upgrades to compare performance. Why did I get this Classic Mac Pro? I wanted to see for myself what could be done with this machine in 2020. You can watch all kinds of great upgrade videos, I'll link my favorites below, but they don't give you a good feel for how well a computer performs or how well it directly compares against other newer Macs. The one I have here is actually a 2009 Mac Pro 4,1 that has had its firmware upgraded to 5,1 by its original owner. This machine is in nice condition, was well cared for, and came with a few extras including the original box. This is a single CPU system that is really inexpensive, easy to upgrade, and readily available. It comes with a 4-core CPU, the Xeon W3520 running at 2.66 GHz base and 2.93 GHz boost clock speed. The original owner already upgraded the RAM to 32GB with the faster DDR3 1333MHz version. It also has the stock 640GB spinning hard drive, and the owner upgraded the GPU from the stock NVIDIA GT1 to an ATI Radeon HD5870 GPU with 1 gigabyte of VRAM, which back in the day was the high-end GPU. For the extras, he also added a USB 3 PCIe card to provide four USB 3 ports and he included a SATA to PCIe adapter. If you remember from part two, link above and below, the Mini Mac Pro had a target spec of a six core CPU, 32 gigabytes of RAM, one terabyte SSD, and a Radeon 580 GPU. CPU up upgrades can take several paths and I traveled one conventional path and two not so conventional and much less expensive. For the conventional path I went with the highest end 6 core Xeon X5690 running at 3.46 GHz base and 3.73 GHz boost clock speeds. That processor cost $80. For the unconventional I went with the fastest quad core in the X5677 also running at 3.46 GHz base and 3.73 boost. That processor only cost $13. Finally, I went for the value-oriented 6-core, the X5675 running at 3.06 GHz base and 3.46 GHz boost. That processor cost just $22. Since the RAM was already upgraded to 32GB, I will keep that the same. The spinning hard drive will be replaced with the 1TB Samsung QVO SATA SSD. I also purchased a 2.5-inch SSD drive sled for easy installation into the Mac Pro. I went with the QVO drive for its price and due to the slower SATA 2 bus speeds which was standard on this machine is not capable of allowing SATA 3 transfer speeds. These upgrades alone will bring this machine up to the specs of a high-end 2012 machine that would have cost $5,024. Finally, the GPU upgrade will be the Sapphire RX 580 Pulse with 8GB of VRAM. Let's upgrade this Mac Pro. This classic Mac Pro is a joy to work on. It is just a fantastic piece of engineering by the Apple engineers. It doesn't have a ton of wires running through the system. The CPU tray is just ingenious and makes swapping out the RAM and the CPU a breeze. The access to the four PCIe slots is fantastic and the drive sleds are the best thing ever. I have three open drive bays that I can add storage as needed. Because of that, I will have plenty of space to store and back up all of my files and videos for the foreseeable future. After working on this machine, I now understand why original owners were so upset with Apple when they replaced this with a trash can. The two are just not in the same league. I have installed Mojave since that is the last official supported Mac OS on this system. It will be supported with security fixes until the fall of 2021. Others have installed Catalina on these Mac Pros using a patcher. However, I wanted to get some time in with this system so I have the same reference point for comparisons and it will give Apple time to work out the bugs in Catalina. How well does it run? Before the upgrades, this system felt like an old computer and I mean old. Having 
having a spinning hard drive and a CPU that only runs in the 2 gigahertz range really feels slow in 2020. The two biggest upgrades that made this machine come alive were the SSD and the CPU. With the CPU now running into the 3 gigahertz range, this machine feels modern. I can tell you that just in general use alone, this computer feels like, well, not a new computer, more like a last generation computer. It's not super fast like the current gen CPUs that turbos to 5 gigahertz, but wow, this thing feels very usable in 2020. But how does it perform? To maximize the speeds using its triple channel memory bus, I remove one stick of RAM. Let's look at the benchmarks. Four CPUs. That's a lot of benchmarking. This video took longer to make since I wanted to spend at least a week with each processor and with four processors, well, that's a month right there. The CPU temps never get hot. Peak temp on the X5690 was always under 65C, a long way from 100C as Apple typically runs their computers today. The RX 580 Pulse GPU is a little faster than the Radeon Pro 580X that comes standard with the new Mac Pro. SSD read write speeds are limited to the bus speeds of the SATA 2 bus and are just 256 megabytes read and 258 megabytes write. This thing will just render for days and days. The problem is that sometimes it feels like it takes days and days to render. Running the standard Bruce X benchmark in Final Cut, this machine completed it in 20 seconds, which is more of a function of the RX 580 graphics card. In editing 4K video, the base processor, the W3520, just felt underwater the whole time. It dropped frames consistently and was always under a large load during playback. In other words, the CPU was over 600% in use, that's out of 800%, so it didn't have much headroom. Room. Switching out to the faster quad core, the X5677 improved that situation and now the processor usage was just over 400% and it did pretty good. However, the time to render the video was just way too long. A 4K video took almost 5 times real time or a 10 minute video will take just under 50 minutes. Moving over to the 6 core processors greatly helped but the CPU was still working hard when using compressed formats and it feels very heavy on the system compared to my Mini Mac Pro. It would still drop frames, just not as often. You can get away with simple clips of 4K 24 frames per second. However, if you start adding some effects, titles, transitions, or color grading, then this system gets slow very fast. In these cases, you can still get the job done. You'll just have to adjust your workflow to allow for the creation of optimized media and or proxies. Once that is done, the system has no problems. In rendering out a video, for the X5675, it took just under four times real time, while the X5690 consistently takes just over three times real time. So in other words, a 10 minute video will take about a half hour to render. In contrast, my mini 
Mini Mac Pro will render that same 10 minute project in real time or about 10 minutes. I am really curious, if I did get the dual CPU tray, would the render times be cut in half and get closer to the speed of my Mini Mac Pro? Let me know in the poll above or comments below if that's something you would like to see. Compared to the newer architectures, the first generation of Intel CPUs are showing their age. The single core performance does fall short of modern CPUs as shown in the single threaded benchmarks. It even lags the i3 Mac Mini. However, with the upgraded CPUs, it's still better than the i3 for the multi-core performance. If you ask my opinion of this Mac Pro in the first couple of days when I just set it up before any upgrades, I would have said it's slow and don't bother. However, after upgrading the processor and GPU and moving to an SSD and after using it exclusively for the past couple of weeks, I can say that even though it is not as powerful, it just works. I have been able to use this to create the past couple of videos, including this one. This classic Mac Pro really offers very good performance considering the cost. What did it cost? Let's go over that now. Now the total of just over $700 is getting close to the cost of the base level i3 Mac Mini. You can easily lower the total cost to around $500. Three areas you could easily save money. You don't have to get such a nice Mac Pro. Plenty are available for less. You don't have to purchase a one terabyte SSD as a 500 gigabyte would be fine to start with and you don't need to get the Sapphire Pulse as any RX 580 will do. Quite frankly, this machine surprised me in how well it ran in 2020. Think of it this way. A high-end system from the 2012 era is an okay entry-level system in 2020. It is a Mac. It runs super reliable, never thermal throttles. It sleeps and wakes and just performs solid every day. This is your best budget option. People have even installed Windows 10 and overclocked the CPU to use it as a 1080p gaming system. That's something I'll show in a future video, so subscribe if interested. This thing is so nice that instead of my original plan of just upgrading, reviewing, and then selling it, I am going to keep this machine. I'm going to set this up to store and back up all of my files from my Mini Mac Pro setup, and it will serve as my backup computer. It's still very useful and can still get work done in 2020. I just would recommend keeping the total cost lower than the cost of an i3 Mac Mini. If you found this video informative, hit the like button, share this video with friends you know who are into Macs, and subscribe for more. Let me know in the comments below or the poll above, is the classic Mac Pro something you would consider in 2020? In part four, we're going to have some fun and explore if Apple chose to use another consumer-based platform, not the expensive server-grade platform, for the Mac Pro and answer some of the fundamental questions like like, how well would it run Mac OS? What kind of performance would you get? And how would it compare to the new Mac Pro? That is going to do it for this one. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.